Hello and welcome to the third data visualization project. So today we're going to be looking at creating a heat map and what that basically means is we have these like squares and they show up with different colors depending on the values that they have. So in this graph we're looking at uh, land surface temperature throughout the years and months and we just have these squares to change color based on the temperature. We also have an average temperature and then when you hover over it, it shows the variance from those temperatures. And we have this data set right here that we can work with. So if I just open this up, oops. We have the base temperature and then an array of objects that show the years and months and the variance from this base temperature. And we need to convert this into a heat map like this. And we have to fulfill these 17 user stories, although I don't know why this one says 16 twice, but we have 17 user stories in total to fulfill. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've generated a skeleton HTML template, set the title, and I've imported the D3 script that we need to use D3 for. Um, I've also imported the free code cam test suite. I've imported my own script file, which I've created created right here. I've created an SVG with an ID of canvas, and this is where we'll draw our graphs. And I've also set some basic styling. So I've said HTML and body will take 100% of the height. Uh, we have a background color of white smoke on the SVG, just so we can see it. And I've set kind of centered everything using Flexbox. So what I'm just gonna do is open this up in live server. So yeah, this is what we're working with. So we have set up the project, we've got this test suite, and we have a canvas right here. So yeah, we can get started now. So now that we have our canvas created and our test suite imported, what I'm going to do is just walk you through the structure of our code. So what I've done is I've just created a bunch of variables and functions, and I'm quickly gonna explain what they are. So URL is just the as a string, the URL of our data. So this will be used when we're importing it. We also have rec, which is a new XML HTTP request. And we're gonna be using this rec to actually import and pass our data into a JavaScript object. I have base temp here. And base temp is basically going to be used to store this number right here when we import it. We have values and values will be used to store this array of monthly variance objects when we've imported that. I also have X scale and Y scale. So X scale will be the scale that will be used to create our X axis as well as place our cells horizontally. And Y scale will be used to create our Y axis as well as place our cells vertically. I also have some numbers specified for the dimensions of our canvas. So I have width set to 1200. I have height set to 600 and I have padding set to 60. So padding is just basically the distance between like our outermost contents of our canvas and the edge of the canvas so that we can have some room in between. I've also created a variable canvas and this selects the D3 element. So it'll, it's a D3 selection that selects this element with the ID of canvas. And now we can just use canvas to reference this whenever we want. I also got, went ahead and set the width attribute of the canvas to width and the height attribute of the canvas to height. Finally, I've created some functions which we're going to fill in as we go through. So I have generate scales and what this is going to do is to generate the actual, create the actual scales and set them to these variables. I have draw cells which will be used to draw the rectangular cells, so these onto our canvas and also set their height property x and y coordinates etc. And I also have draw axis which will be used to draw the axis, so the x and y axis onto our chart. So now what we're going to do is look at importing this JSON data into our page so that we can start using it. So the first thing we're going to do is open up this XML HTTP request that we created and we're going to set some properties for it. So I'm going to call the open method on rec and this takes in three properties. So the first property is the method we want to perform. And since we're fetching a JSON object, this method is get. The second argument is the URL of our resource and we have it assigned to the variable URL right here. So I'm just gonna put URL. 
And the third argument declares whether we want this to run asynchronously or not. And I'm just going to put that to true. Next thing I'm going to do is set the onload. And remember, onload is a reference to a function to run once we have a response to our request. And remember, the response gets actually stored in a field called response text. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to console.log the response text field just so we can have a look at what we get back. Finally, what I'm going to do is just send off the request. So if we save that now and go back to this and I open up the console, we can see that we have this response text right here. And this comes in the form of a JSON string. So what we need to do is pass this into a JavaScript object. So what I'm going to say is let object. And then I'm going to call the json.pass method. And this method takes in a JSON string and converts it into a JavaScript object. And then what it will do is assign it to the variable object. So I'm going to give it the response text. Then what I'm going to do is, so remember we have in the response text, we have a base temperature and a monthly variance. So I want to set the base temperature to this value base temp. So what I'm going to do is base temp equals, and then it'll be object dot base temperature. So object, so I'm going to select it like this. So base temperature like this. And what we also want to do is set the values which we created to store our array in. So I'm just going to set this to an empty array to start off with. And what we want to do is set values to this monthly variance array instead. So I'm going to say values equals object dot monthly. Actually, I'm going to use the bracket of notation here. So monthly variance. And then I'm just going to go ahead and log both of these just to make sure we have them correct. So I'm going to log base temp and I'm also going to log the values array. So if we save that now, we can see that we've got the base temp right here and we have values which is an array of JavaScript objects that we can actually use. So now that we've imported our data, we should think about the order that we want to do things. So the first thing I'm going to do is generate the scales because we use the scales later on when we're drawing the cells or drawing the axis. So I'm going to run the generate scales method. Then I'm going to run the draw cells method to draw our rectangular cells on. And finally, I'm going to draw the axis. So I'm going to run the draw axis method. So what this will do is we've opened our request, we set some properties. Once we get a res response back, what it does is it sets the base temp to the base temperature. It sets value to the monthly variance array. It logs both of those and then it runs the generate scale, then the draw cells and then the draw axis. So now that we've imported our data, we can look at creating the actual heat map itself and starting to fulfill some of these user stories. So let's look at user story one. And what it says is my heat map should have a title with the corresponding ID equals title. So to do this, we can just create any element in the document. So what I'm going to do is just above the canvas here, I'm going to get, create a header one and I'm going to give it the ID of title, like they said. And then I'm just going to copy and paste this right here as the title. So if I save that now, if we look at this, we can see that we have an element with the ID of title. So if we run the test, we can see that user story one has been completed. So let's look now at completing user story two. And what it says is my heat map should have a description with the corresponding ID equals description. So again, you can just create any tag in the document with an ID of description. So I'm just gonna create a H4 here and set the ID to description like they said. And I'm also just gonna write some descriptive text. So I'm just gonna say temperatures from 
1753 to 2015 average is 8.66 C I think it was so if I save that now we can see we have our description right here and we have a h4 with the ID of description so I'm just going to run the test now and we can see the user story 2 has been successfully completed so let's look at user story 3 now and what it says is we should have an x-axis with the ID of x-axis so we just basically need to generate a horizontal axis here so the first thing we need to do is start of defining our x scale that we'll use to generate the axis. So what I'm going to do here is just say x scale equals. I remember we'll get this updated value when we draw the axis because generate scales runs before draw axis. So because the x scale, so if we look at the x scale, it uses the years right here. And if we look at our objects in here, we can see that the year is just a number. So we can just use a linear scale here. There's no need to use a time scale. So I'm gonna say d 3 scale linear. We don't have to worry about the domain for now. We just need to create an axis. So we just have to think about the range of where we want our x axis to go from. So if you think about it, we want our x values and our x axis to start from about here because we have this padding of 60, remember? So we wanted to start from about here and we want to end it about here with the padding on this side as well. So the x values we can have is from padding, so x equals padding here, to x equals width, which is the width of our SVG canvas, take away padding. So it goes from padding to width minus padding. So well, what I'm going to do is set the range of this. And remember, range takes in an array of two elements, which are the maximum and minimum value. So the minimum value, like we said, was padding. And the maximum value was width take away padding, like this. So it goes from padding to width take away padding. Next thing we need to do is actually create the x-axis. So what I'm going to do is, where we have draw axis, I'm going to create a variable called x-axis. And in terms of the type of axis we want, we want it to be, so since we want the line about here and we want the element the text or the labels to be under the line it's going to be an axis bottom so d3 dot axis bottom and we want to give it the scale which we created earlier so that'll be x scale okay so now that we've created the axis we need to draw it onto the canvas itself and to do this we need to create an svg group element so we're going to append our canvas with a new group element and remember group element is a g tag so I'm going to give it G like this. And then if I run the call method, what I can do is if I call the x-axis, it'll generate this x-axis, which is a set of SVG elements, and it puts it inside this group right here. So let's save that now. So we can see that we've got our axis right here. And the only problem is it's in the wrong position. So we're okay in terms of the x because it's between padding and width minus padding, but the only thing is we need to adjust the y. And if we think about where we want it to be, we want it to be about here. So we want a distance of padding between the bottom of the canvas and the axis right here. So we need to move it along the y, and remember in SVG positive y means downwards. So we need to move it down by height and then back up by padding. So that'll be height take away padding. So we're going to translate it by height take away padding along the y-axis. So to do this, we need to set a transform attribute. So I'm just going to call the attribute method. And I'm going to say transform here. And the transformation we want to give it is a translate. And remember, we're OK on the x-axis because we're fine here because it's correctly aligned in the center. So this is going to be zero comma. And remember, we want to move it down the y-axis. Again, positive y means going down. We want to move it down by height take away padding. So this will be height take away padding on the y. So we're moving it by zero comma height take away padding. So if I save this now, one second. 
Oh, I need to close this off with another bracket. Oops. So yeah, height translate by zero comma height takeaway padding. So if we save it now, we can see that the axis is in the correct position. The final thing to do is just give it the ID of X axis, like they said. So I'm going to call the attribute method again and set the ID this time. And they said they wanted it to be X dash axis. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it in here. So if we look at the console now, we can see that we have an element called X axis, which is an axis right here. So that should be user story three completed. So let's have a look. So yeah, we've we've got we've completed user story three successfully. So let's look at creating a y axis as well now. And this is where we'll be finishing user story four. So what this says is we just need to create a y axis and set the ID to y dash axis. So in terms of at the x-axis we were okay with using numbers because the years were just numbers but if we look here the months are stored as numbers as well but in the final product the months need to be strings so this means we have to do some kind of conversion and this means that we're better off working with dates so we can convert easily between strings and numbers so what we're going to do instead is when we create y scale to create the y-axis from we're going to use a scale time instead this will become a bit more clearer why we're doing this later on but we don't have to worry about the domain for now even though we're working with dates we just have to set the range so we need to think about where we want the smallest y value and the largest y value to be so the smallest y value since the y-axis consists of months is the smallest month or January and we want that to be near the top here so the distance between here is, if we start at y equals 0, there's a distance of padding. So we want the smallest value to be at padding. So I'm going to call the range method. And remember, range takes an array of the smallest and largest value. So I'm going to put padding here as the smallest value. In terms of the largest value, that's the largest month or December. And December goes near the bottom here. And if we look at the y-axis, we've moved down by height. So it's a height to the SVG canvas, and we moved back up by padding. So this will be height takeaway padding. So the largest is height takeaway padding. To summarize again, the range of y values we want goes from y equals padding to y equals height takeaway padding. So let's use the scale to create an axis now. So first thing I'm going to do is say let y axis equals, and I'm just going to put a space here just for each access oops so this time uh, we want the labels or the ticks so these things here to be on the left of the line so I'm going to call axis left this time and we're going to give it the y scale that we created here so the next thing to do is actually draw this y axis onto the canvas so to do this we're going to have to create another group element so I'm going to call the append method on the canvas again and append it with another group element. Oops. And I'm going to use the call method to create the y axis inside this group. I'm going to set the attribute to of ID to y axis like they said. So this is the y dash axis. So if we have a look right now, we can see the y axis has been created. The only problem is it's out of place. So in terms of the y coordinates, we're okay because we have padding here and padding here, but we need to change the x and we want to push it right like this by a distance of padding so that it lines up with this. So we want to give it a translate transformation. So I'm going to set a transformation attribute like this. So transform and we want to translate it. Now, we want to translate it because positive x is to the right. We want to translate it by padding on the positive x to move it to the right by padding. So this will be padding. And like I said, in terms of the y, we're OK. So I'm just going to put comma 0. So we translated it by padding comma 0. 
And if we look now, this is lined up perfectly here to create an axis. Don't worry about these numbers for now because it's not that important. But if we look at the console now, we have an axis right here with the ID of Y axis. So that should be enough. So let's run the test now. And we can see that we've passed user story 4. So let's move on to user story 5 now. And what it says is my heat map should have rectangular elements with classical cell that represent the data. So what we have to do is basically create a cell for each of the items in this array. So this is where we'll use the draw cells method. So the first thing I'm going to do is select all the rectangles in the canvas. So I'm going to do canvas.select all. And remember SVG rectangles have the tag rect. And then I'm going to call the data method to bind it to this values array right here. So what this means is that any rectangles in this is associated. So every rectangle in this canvas is associated with one of these elements. Then I'm going to call the enter method, and this means we're about to specify what to do for any of these array elements that don't have rectangle elements, which is all of these in this case. And we, what we wanted to do is create a new rectangle element, and we want to set its class to cell, like this said. So I'm going to call the attribute method, set the class, and then set the value to cell. So if we save this now, and we have a look in the SVG canvas for all the items in the array, we've created a rectangle with the class of cell. So that should be user story five completed now. So let's have a look. And yeah, that, that was done. So let's take a look at user story six now. And what it says is there should be at least four different fill colors used for the cells. So like we have here, we can see that all these cells are different colors based on the temperature that they are. And we have this legend here to try and identify these. So what we want to do is based on the temperature, we want to return a different fill color. But the temperature isn't given here and what they've given instead is a variance. So what we can do instead is return a different color based on the variance. And what I'm going to do is return colors. So I'm going to return bluer colors for when we're under the variance and then redder colors for when we're over the variance. So to do this, first thing we're going to do is set the fill attribute like this. And this will have as the value a function that takes in one of the items. So this item represents one of these items in the array. And what we want to do is return values based on the variance. So what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say variance, and I'm just going to say equals item variance like this. So what this is, is basically this field right here. And then I'm going to say if variance is, let's say if it's less than or equal to minus two, then return. And I'm just going to go with steel blue as the color. And then let's say else if, and if it's less severe, so the variance is less than or equal to minus one, let's say. Actually, no, let's, let's put this as minus one, and let's put this as zero. So if it's on or below the average uh, return, and I'm going to put maybe a less severe version of this, so light steel blue like this. And then I'm going to say else if, and this time we're going to look at above average cases, so if variance is less than one. So if it's less than one degrees over, I'm going to return orange, so that's slightly on the warmer side. And finally, it means that it's over, so I'm going to put this as equals actually. So if it's over one degree variance, then this is this large change, so I'm going to put return crimson, which is like a reddish color. So if we save this now, and we take a look at the SVG rectangles, we can see that they have different colors. And this is because the items in the array had different variances. So as long as we return, or we have rectangles that have at least four different colors, this should be okay. 
So if we have a look now, we can see that user story six has been completed successfully. So let's move on to user story seven now. And what it says is each cell will have the properties or attributes data month, data year, and data temp containing month, year, and temperature values. So what we essentially need to do is just create these attributes on these rectangles. So the first thing I'm going to do is create the data year attribute. And that's just going to be like this. And the second argument is just a function that takes in the item in the array. And it doesn't matter what you return for this specific challenge. So I'm just going to return item. I should complete this properly, but since we're working on a user story basis, I'm just going to do what's enough to pass the test. So I'm going to set data month. And again, this is going to be a function that takes in an item from the array. And again, I'm going to return item. And finally, we have the data temp attribute. And again, this is going to take in an item from the array. And it doesn't matter what we return, so I'm just going to put return item. So if we save this now, and we go into the console and have a look, we can see that the rectangles have a data month, a data temp, and a data year field. And this is exactly all we need for this specific challenge. And we can see that user story seven has been completed successfully. So now if we take a look at user story eight, what it says is the data month and the data year should be within the range of the data. So now what we need to do is actually set this data month and data year properly because last time we just returned the item. So if we have a look at this data, we can see that the year is stored in a field called year. So if we have a function that takes in an item here, we can simply just return item year when we're setting data year. When we're setting data month, we can see that we have a month stored here as a number. So we can just return item month here. But there's an important thing to note here, and that's the fact that, actually, I'll show you what happens later. So finally, we have the data temp, and we need to return the temperature here. But if we look at the items in the array, they don't have a temperature. But what we do have is a base temp and a variant. And we can calculate the temperature from this. So the actual temperature would be the base temp plus the variance. So what I'm going to do is return base temp. Remember, we stored the uh, base temperature field right here into this variable called base temp. So we can just use base temp. And I'm going to plus item variance. So if I save that now and I run the test, you can see that it still fails. And that's because the data month should be at most 11. So if we have a look at the months here, we have the month starting from one going all the way up to 12. So like January to December. But JavaScript months start at zero and they end at 11. So what we need to do is make sure we convert these into zero based. So the only way to do this is just to take away one from the month. So we start from zero and end at 11. Now we're in the correct range. So if I'm going to, if I just open up the console really quick, we can see that the data year and the data month have been set correctly as well as the actual temperature. So let's run the test now. And we can see that user story eight now passes when the months are in the correct range. So let's look at fulfilling user story nine now. And what it says is we should have the cells aligning correctly on the Y axis. Now, what this means is we have to actually start setting the domain of the scale. So we have to tell it to use these months right here. And since we're working with the scale time here, the, dom the domain can only take in data objects. So what we need to do is construct data objects from months. And the way you do this is by creating a new data object. And if we look at the W3Schools page, it says that to construct a date, we specify a year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and millisecond in that order. So if we think about the largest, oh, sorry, the smallest value that we're going to have, that's going to be the smallest month that we get. And that's a January. And 
even though the month says one here, in JavaScript, the months always start from the zero. So what I'm going to do is create a new date here. And when it's January, the year is zero, because we're not concerned about the year. The month is zero. The day is zero. The number of hours is zero. Minutes, zero. Second, zero. Millisecond, zero. The maximum value for the domain is going to be when the month is December. And in even though it goes up to 12 here, the, in JavaScript, that is going to be when the month value is equal to 11. So this will be a new date and we'll have zero and then the month is 11, zero, zero. So day, hours, zero, minutes, seconds and milliseconds is zero. So we have the domain as being the smallest date object where the month is zero or January, the largest date object when the month is December. So if we have a look now, what we have is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 of these ticks, or we have 12 if we include this. But the problem is, the way I'm doing it, I'm going to have, so the rectangle for March, or the cell for March, would have its Y positioned in March. So between March and April, I would have the rectangle for March. Between April and May, I would have the rectangle for April. And the problem with this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So if I put the rectangles between the ticks, I only have room for 11 rectangles. So what I'm just going to do is, even though this doesn't really work, it, it kind of works in this case. So I'm just going to set the maximum month to 12 so that we actually have another block right here for the month of December. So now I have 12 gaps between the ticks where I can put my rectangles. Yeah, this is just an adjustment that I've had to make. It's not really correct convention. So next thing I'm going to do is actually start thinking about setting the height for the rectangles. And so I'm going to set the height attribute. And what I wanted to return is, let's think about how much height we have in total. So the total height we have is if we ha take from here to here. So this is where all our rectangles will go. This is so we have padding on either side. So this will be the height of the SVG canvas. Take away padding, take away padding. So the total height we have to work with is height minus two times padding. And we have 12 of these slots right here to put our rectangles in. So what we want to do is divide height minus padding by 12 so that we have 12 cells of equal size that we can fit in vertically like this. So what I want to return here is height, take away two times padding. So that's the total area we, ha we have. And then I want to divide this by 12 so that we can fit them all vertically like this. So if we have a look at the console now, I think this will become clear once we start actually seeing the rectangles we can see that all the rectangles now have an equal height of 40. Finally, I'm going to set the Y values of these rectangles. So what this is going to do is set the Y axis like this. And again, we give it a function that takes in one of the items in the array like this. And what we want to do is use the Y scale to give it a Y value in the correct range. And remember the y value, the y coordinate is the top of the rectangle right here. So what I'll do is return y scale. So we're going to be using the y scale. And remember the y scale expects to take in a date. So we have a domain of dates here. So we have to give it a date. And where how we choose where to position the rectangle depends on the actual month they have. So the ones of the month of January go at the top, the ones of the month of Feb go underneath that, and the ones with the month of December go at the very bottom. So what we need to do is convert the month, which is stored in this month field, into a date to give to our Y scale, which will then generate a Y coordinate in the correct range for us. So what I'm going to do is give it a new date here, because we have to give it a date. and I'm going to create a date with the constructor that we used over here. So this constructor right here. So the year is zero. The month is item month. 
But remember that we are working with months 0 to 11 in JavaScript. So these months start from 1 and go up to 12. So I have to take away 1 from here. Then the day is 0, the hours is 0, the minutes is 0, the seconds is 0, and the milliseconds is 0. We don't have to worry about any of that. We just care about the month. So what this will do is it will convert the month into a JavaScript month. It will create a new data object with this, give it to the Y scale, which will give it a Y value in the appropriate range right here. So if we take a look now at this, we can have a look at the rectangles. And we can see that the rectangles have had their Y values set accordingly. So, and if I just go over these really quickly, even though we can't see them because we haven't set the X coordinate, if you look on the left side, you, we can see that they've stacked up quite nicely like this. So let's try submitting that now. And yeah, we can see that user story 9 has now been completed because the rectangles have Y values in the correct. So let's look at actually positioning the rectangles on the x-axis so we can start to see them. So this is where we'll complete user story 10 and what it means is we have to align the cells on the x-axis. And if we look at the x-axis right now there's no way that that can happen because the, this, this, these numbers don't mean anything. That's because we're not specifying the domain when we created the x scale. So what we needed to do is to tell it to use these years. And remember in a domain we specify the minimum and maximum value. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create two variables here. So I'm going to create min year and max year. And this will be used to find the maximum and minimum year. I'm going to put these outside the methods just so we can use them later. So what I'm going to do in this method is I'm going to say let min year equals and we want to select the minimum year. So I'm going to give it the values array, give it a function that takes in one of the items in the array. And we want to look for the items year. So, oops, like this. And I'm going to, sorry, I need to get rid of this let here because we want to assign it to this right here. Then I'm going to set max year, so I'm going to say max year equals d3.max. And again, we're going to give it the values array. And again, we're going to give it a function that takes in one of the items from the array. And we once again want to look at the year. So what this will do is it'll look through this year field of every single object in this array and it will set min year to 1753 or whatever the smallest year was. And it'll set max year to whatever the largest year was. I think that's like 2015 or something. So now we need to specify the range, so the, sorry, the domain of our x scale. So we specify the smallest and largest values it can be. And the smallest value we want it to be our smallest year. So I'm going to put min year here. And the largest value we want it to be our largest year. So I'm going to put max year here. So if we take a look now, we can see that we have it going roughly from 1753 to 2015 along here. So the next thing to do is, because this test specifically doesn't look at the x coordinate, but rather it looks at how it aligns with the values on the x-axis. And right now it won't align because these numbers have a comma in them, so they're not treated as numbers. That's because D3 adds these commas whenever we have a thousand for formatting purposes. So we kind of need to undo this now. And to do that, we have these ticks here, so we need to apply some formatting to these ticks. So what I'm going to do is in the generate axis method where we have the x-axis right here, I'm going to call the tick format on this axis. And when we call the tick format method, what we do is we give it a D3 format. So to generate one of those, you just say D3 format. And I'm going to pass in D here. And what D means is decimal or integer. So it will, conv it will display whatever number it is as just an integer. And if we look now, we've got rid of the commas and the years are showing correctly. So now we need to think about setting the width of our rectangles. So I'm going to call the attribute method with width. 
And let's think about how we set the width. So the total width we have is the like the distance between here and here, the end of the axis. So that's if we think about the width being the whole SVG canvas, we have a distance of width take away padding on the left and take away padding on the right. So we have a total width of width minus two times padding to work with. And we have to divide this between the number of rectangles we need to place. So what we need to do is let's let's put this into a function. We don't really need to take in the item here, but I'm just gonna put this into a function just so we can read it easier. So firstly we need to work out how many rectangles we'll have going along horizontally like this. And that'll be since we have a column for each of the years, it'll be the number of years we have. So to calculate the number of years, we already created a min year and max year here. So we can say let num number of years equals, and then we can just say min year take away max year like this. Or this should be the other way around. This should be max year take away min year. So that, that calculates the number of years. And then what we want to do is we want to split this width of width take away two times padding by the number of years. So we want to return width take away. So I'm going to put this in brackets. So width take away two times padding. And we want to divide this by the number of years because that's the number of rectangles we're going to have horizontally. So yeah, we can see them start to come in now. And if we have a look at the SVG canvas, wow, this is being really slow. Um, we can see that the rectangles all have an equal width of four point something. So that's what it works out to be. Final thing to do is set the actual x coordinates of the rectangles. So I'm going to call the attribute method again. And this time we're setting the x coordinate. And what we want to do is we want to use the x scale to generate an x coordinate in the correct range. So remember the x scale is expecting a year since we have a domain of years. So what we want to do is return x scale and we want to give it item year like this. So look at this. Now we actually have our heat map showing and we have the years correctly like this. So we have all the rectangles fit in nicely. So I'm just gonna make one final tweak to this and that is that because of the end square here goes up to 2014, but we know this goes up to 2015, it means there isn't room for one of these rectangular blocks. So what I'm just gonna do here in the domain here, I'm just gonna add one to the max here. So we have one more block to the right. And now what we have room for here is this one block right here for the year 2015. It's, it's a bit hard to see here, but if we look at this again as well, we can see that 2015 kind of goes to the edge here. And now we've just extended the canvas by adding one more year, extended the axis by adding one more year, just so we can fit in these rectangles right here. So if I zoom in, you can kind of see them right here. So that sh regardless, we've set the x coordinates now for all of the rectangles. So that should be user stories. Uh, what was it on? We are on user story ten now. So yeah, if we look here, we can see that the user story ten has been completed. So what I've just gone ahead and done is I've just made a quick adjustment here. I've just put the number of years calculation right here at the start so that we can avoid repeating this calculation, which is quite inefficient doing it each time we're doing a width. So I've just changed it right here. So let's now look at user story. I think we're on um, 11 now. So what we need to do is to have multiple tick labels with the full month showing. So we've almost got this. The only issue is that we have this one here which just says 1900 and that's because we haven't formatted it. We haven't told it explicitly to show the month and that's what we're going to do. So like we did for the x-axis we're going to give it a tick format for the y-axis and since we're working with 
dates here and we're using a scale time, we need to call the time format method instead. And we're going to give it a format string. And what we need to do is put in percentage capital B. And percentage capital B means show the full month as a string. Small b means the shortened month like Jan, but big B means the full month, which is what we need to do. So what this does is for any of the ticks on this, it can, it show, shows that date for that tick as a month. So if we move over now, we can see that it starts from January and goes all the way down to December. And if I run the test now, we can see that user story 11 has been completed. So let's take a quick look at user story 12. And what it says is my heat map should have multiple tick labels on the x-axis with the years 1750 between 1754 and 2015. Now we've already completed this. And if we look right here, we can see that this starts roughly at 1753 and it goes all the way to about 2015. So yeah, you can see like if I zoom in, I don't think this is necessary, but if I zoom in, we can see like there's like 15 little squares here. So uh, even though we've already done this, I'm just going to say what made this work. So what we had was the X scale with the domain that goes with which has a range of the correct years right here as the minimum and maximum value. And then we called the X axis with that domain and we formatted it with this tick format D here, which converts them into integers. That should be everything for this user story. So again, like I said, we already managed to complete this. So let's look at user story 13 now. And what it says is my heat map should have a legend with an ID of legend. So this basically means that we can create whatever um, element we want and we just have to give it an ID of legend. But if we look at the next one, it says that it has to contain rect elements. And rect elements are SVG rectangles and we can only draw these inside SVG tags. So this ID's legend has to be an SVG canvas. So I'm going to just put it, you can place it anywhere in the document. So just create SVG ID equals legend like this. Close that off, save it, and just try running the function now. And yeah, you can see that user story 13 has now been passed. So let's look at user story 14 now. And what it says is my legend should contain rectangle elements. So this one's really easy to do. I mean, you can do it properly here, but for this particular test, all we have to do is just create some rectangle elements. So because I have four different colors right here, what I'm gonna do is just create four different rectangle elements here inside this. If I just save that now, and we open the console, and we look inside legend, we can see it contains rectangle elements. So just run the test like this. And yeah, this one's passed as well. So in user story 15, what we have to do is make sure the rectangle elements use at least four different fill colors. So since we're creating a since we're creating a legend like this here, we just have to show what these colors mean. And the rectangles have different fill colors, as we can see. Now this one, you can, it's actually not as hard as the way I make it out to be. But what I've just done is I've created some rectangles with, and I've filled them with the same colors that I used for my cells. And I've just put some text with it to tell it like, what each of these means. Now, you don't have to do any of this. All you have to do is just basically fill your rectangles with different colors. Um, and I've, you'll also have to end up playing around because because you have to do it with SVG. The positioning is kind of hard. So I just had to keep playing around with the X and Y values of the text rectangles until I found what worked. Um, yeah, it's not perfect, as you can see. So we have these rectangles and um, we have this text here and I'll change the colors of these later but I've essentially just created a legend here I guess and we have rectangles with four different fill colors so if I run the test we can see that user story 15 has now passed so finally we can move on to user story 16 and what it is very similar to the previous projects and we just have to create a tooltip that when we mouse over these squares it displays more information and the tooltip has to have an ID of tooltip. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a div. I'm not, I'm going to do it above the canvas this time. So I'm just going to say div id equals tooltip like this. And this will be where we put our tooltip information. Um, I'm also going to give it some CSS. So we want to make sure it's not showing when we're hovering the mouse. Oops, having a hard time with the keyboard again. So we want to make sure it's not showing when we don't put the mouse over a rectangle. So we want to set the visibility to hidden by default. And this is just some CSS right here. And I'm also going to set the height and width to auto, but I don't think you need to do this really, but I'm just going to do it just in case. Next thing I'm going to do is, while we selected this SVG canvas, I'm just going to make another selection here. So I'm going to say let tooltip equals d3.select. And I'm going to give it a CSS selector of tooltip. So now this tooltip variable will just reference this tooltip that we created. So what we want to do is, when we put our mouse cursor over these tooltips, sorry, over these rectangles, we want to make the tooltip visible. So to do this, when we come down to our rectangle, we need to create, we need to call on and create a mouse over event. So mouse over means the cursor is above the object or the rectangle. And we can give this a function that takes in one of the items in the array. Um, oh, I forgot the comma. So what we need to do is we need to change the style of the tooltip. And to do this, we have to call the transition method on the tooltip to tell it we're going to change its style. And what we're going to do is then set the style. And the style we want to set is visibility. And we want to set it to visible. So what this will mean is when we put our mouse cursor over one of the rectangles, it becomes visible. Next thing we want to do is actually set some text for the tooltip, and we can do this with the D3 text method. And let's let's see what we can set here. So I'm going to create an array called month names, and this is this is just so that we can easily trans um, we can easily translate the month numbers into month names. So I'm just going to say month names equals, and then I'm going to put January. I'm going to set the text. So the first thing I'm going to set is I want to show the year. So I'm going to put item year like this. So this renders the year. Then what I'm going to do is put a space and then I'm going to render the month. And to do this, what I can do is say month names and then like this. And I can say item month takeaway one. So for a month of January, item month will be equal to one. So that gets converted to zero. And the month name zero is equal to January. So yeah, that's how that works. Then I'm going to put maybe a, a colon. And then actually I'll put a dash. And I'm going to put the temperature. So the temperature is calculated by doing base temp plus the variance and then maybe I will put the so I'll open up a bracket here and I will put the actual variance and then finally close the bracket so I've set the text to show the year of the year, the month, the actual temperature at that time, and then I've put in brackets the variance. Um, I'm also going to just put a space here just to make it nicer. Okay, so the final thing we need to do is make sure that we make it disappear again when the mouse moves out. So I'm going to create a mouse out event. And this again takes in a function that has the array item as the input. And we just want to transition this back to hidden again. So if I copy and paste this and put this to hidden. So now if I move my mouse off it, we can see that it becomes hidden. And if I put my mouse over it, we have the tooltip here displaying information. So yeah.
if I run the method now, the test, sorry, we can see that user story 16 or tooltip test one has now passed. So what we finally can do is move on to the final user story, which is user story 17 or 16 again in this case. And what we have to do is set the data year attribute to the data year of the active area. So the tooltip needs to have a data year attribute that's the same as a data year. So to do this, uh, when we put our mouse over it, what we can do is just after we set the text here, we can just call the attribute method on the tooltip. And we want to set the data year attribute like this. And it has to be the same as the data year of the square. And if we look at how we calculate the data year of the square, we just returned item year. So we can just, since we're already doing a function that takes in an item, we can just set the data year to item year like this. So if I just open the console now, and we have this tooltip here. If I put my mouse over it, you can see that the data year changes depending on which square I'm currently at. Okay, so second time it seems to have worked for some reason. I think it was having a some kind of glitch. So yeah, we've completed all the user stories now and we have a completely functional heat map, I guess. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and do some CSS styling so what I've just done is added some CSS styling to this and I've just changed the font and mainly just changed the colors. So if we look now, we have this like lighter background, I guess, or a purpley background and then a bluish SVG canvas. And this kind of blends in a bit better now. So we have the legend here and I said the title. And I've also changed this degree C to an actual one, but it kind of looks a bit funny right now. So yeah, again, if we hover over the tooltip appears, the legend is at the bottom. Added a hover effect to make it black when we mouse over a rectangle. So we have that here. So the functionality shouldn't have changed at all. So if I run the tests, yep, all the tests pass. So yeah, we basically completed this project. So we turned all of this data into a nice heat map right here. So yeah, thank you for watching.